Do they drink too much at first? Or? Okay, we'll get started. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anahita Williamson. I'm the director of the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute at RIT. So, welcome to our morning session on healthy communities and healthy economy. Um, I'd like to welcome our panelists today. We have David Hogenkamp, uh, Aaron Heaney, and Bob Bechtold, who traveled from all over to be here this morning, and I really appreciate that. I think we can have some really good discussion. Now, this is a smaller group, and this is what happened yesterday as well. So um, over time, as more people come in, you know, we'll have more discussion. But I'd like to ask all of you to really think about some of the questions you have, some of the opportunities we have here. As we move forward in the future, and as we have more development and more opportunities to really make some changes, how can we have better interaction between the communities and the economy and industry and government. You know, how can we make changes and how can we do that here so that we can see the progression over time? I think it's a great opportunity to ask this panel. They have a lot of great expertise. And if you think about it right now, I think there's two ends of the spectrum. We have this great examples, I think the most famous is from Denmark, of industrial eco parks, where it's really this cradle to cradle model where there's industry set up so that waste from one is input to another, right? And that keeps going along and that's really cradle to cradle, not much waste. That's really one end of the spectrum. Then you have the other end, which is also more of an extreme case, but that's going on right now in Tonawanda, New York, and Aaron will probably mention that as well, where you have a community, there's a lot of industry, there's a lot of mobility going on there, and there is air pollution, and it's very real, and people have gotten sick, so you have that case as well. Then you have a lot of cases in between, where there's industries just all over the place, living with community, um, and you know, we're, as through the Institute, we do a lot of work with industry to help them optimize their processes, to reduce their waste stream, to reduce their costs, to, be, to help them become more competitive. But we also have been doing it one by one by one to some extent. For ourselves, we're looking at, for instance, the food industry. You have, that's a major industry for New York State, food and ag. Instead of going in to help one cheese processor, one dairy processor, one fish processor, how can we look at this industry more as a sector and try to optimize those waste streams. There's a lot of food waste, for instance, rather than just sending it down the sewer or sending it off to get land spread, can we take similar waste streams and use systems like fermentation to make ethanol, which then can be converted to energy? Can we make biofuels? Can we use anaerobic digestion? But we have to understand the logistics of the companies, the waste streams, to be able to do something like that, the synergy and the community. Do they want to see something like this? So, with that, let's get started. Um, we'll start with David, David Hogenbach, and um, continue from there. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I traveled two blocks down the street, so it was pretty easy for me. <coughs> My name is David Hogenkamp. I'm with Empire State Future. Uh, what we do is we promote sustainable community and economic development throughout New York State. Um, what we call sustainable community economic development is smart growth. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with smart growth, but there are certain uh, aspects that we really pay attention to. Uh, what we consider smart growth throughout a diverse state is what is a regionally appropriate sustainable community and economic development. Uh, we, we talk about regionally appropriate because what makes sense for New York City, Long Island, does not make sense for Buffalo, Albany, and what makes sense for our rural areas does not make sense for even a Buffalo, Albany. Uh, we focus on main streets, rural and urban. We're not just pro-urban everything, uh, but we do maintain that uh, urban areas are very important to the future success of uh, our, our, our state. So who we are, we're a coalition of 52 organizations. We started in 2007. Uh, our mission is dedicated to the revitalization of New York's main streets, town centers, and urban areas. This is our coalition. To date, uh, we're really proud that we have a lot of local community groups uh, statewide environmental groups, as well as private businesses. Um, we have, you can't see it there on top, the Le uh, Leyland Alliance, um, Jonathan Rose Companies. These are a lot of developers who are doing really good things in the smart growth world, building the right kind of buildings that we think will be successful for New York State in the future. Uh, there's four main areas we focus on. Uh, we focus on government accountability. We focus on policy advocacy. We fo focus on education. Uh, that's probably our, our biggest focus is education. Getting out there to businesses, to local communities, to the state government, to everyone and saying, hey, this is what makes sense. Take a look at what the future of our state looks like and let's think of uh, solutions to make sure that we have uh, good economic development and uh, a healthy environment going forward. 
So just to give you an idea of what we did the past two years is we worked a lot on complete streets. I think this relates uh, directly to uh, healthy businesses. Healthy businesses in the smart growth world are businesses where people can be healthy getting to them. It supports small business. So complete streets, uh, it creates a more walkable environment and bikeable environment for everyone, uh, every user. Uh, we think it really helps Main Street businesses, which are vital to the success of our towns, urban centers, our existing areas where existing public infrastructure is built. We also focus on the Land Banks Act. Both these were passed this past year. And the Land Banks Act uh, creates a, uh, a nonprofit that can focus on local solutions to the issues of vacancy and abandonment. Uh, these are, you see these two houses here. This is from uh, a picture in Buffalo that was in the New York Times. Um, this can be used as a model to help uh, revitalize some of our existing commercial structures to fit the needs of businesses today. Uh, it gets these properties out of that uh, cycle of abandonment where it goes into foreclosure, someone picks it up, and then it goes back in foreclosure. It's a model that's worked very successfully in Flint, Michigan, and throughout Michigan. Uh, law allows for 10 land banks, and uh, right now uh, they're allowing five by a March deadline. That's uh, Empire State Development. So just to give you an idea of what we focus on, we're a really broad state with a lot of different diverse issues. You have your upstate urban areas, which those of you from Buffalo, it's my original hometown, uh, you, you know this, sprawl is a major issue. Uh, you have the same amount of people uh, in 2000 that you had in 1950, yet we have three times more uh, urbanized area. Uh, this, is, this impacts our farmers, this impacts our existing towns, it impacts our state when we can't afford the infrastructure that already exists while still putting pipes out into what we consider in the middle of nowhere. Uh, then in downstate world, the Westchesters, Rockland, uh, Long Island, I lived there for three years too, uh, they have a whole different issue where uh, more and more people are moving to that area and more and more of upper uh, Westchester, Putnam, Orange are being suburbanized. and. Um, Growth is good if it's done in the right way in the right place where we as a government can afford it and, as, uh, and we put businesses where people can get to them in uh, an efficient manner. And of course New York City, uh, they've grown a million people since 1990 I believe and they're expected to put another million in before uh, 2030. Anyone from the city here today? Or all upstaters, huh? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, how efficient the city can be, where they, they can definitely fit another th a million people in there, but they're going to have to make sure they do the right things to improve quality of life so that businesses want to stay, they want to be productive, they see the benefits of the alternative transportation that the city has to offer. Five more minutes. Uh, state and national trends, the reason why we think um, healthy businesses need to be in our main streets, in our existing urban areas, First off, when gas was $4.15 um, just a little while ago, I know it's come down since then, um, we factored that out to be about a $4,300 increase to a family um, since 2005. That's a lot of money and when you only have a choice to go to uh, car dependent places to shop, to, to work, uh, that's, that's an impact on our economy. Uh, it's not just at the gas pump, heating oil, natural gas, electricity, they've all outpaced income in uh, upstate New York. But uh, the good thing that you know, we're, we're excited about the future because people are wanting to move back down to main streets, to urban areas where we think healthy businesses can survive. Housing demand, 88% of uh, people think quality of uh, their neighborhood is more important than the size of their home. People want to live um, in smaller areas where they're more connected. Uh, they, they want things like front porches, um, this is good if they live in more walkable environments, it supports local business, it also helps with the public health epidemic. epidemic. Uh, you know, right now you guys are probably familiar with this, one of uh, every four New Yorkers is obese, uh, childhood obesity is a major issue, and what we spend on um, trying to, 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 to deal with diabetes and health related from uh, obesity related problems, it, it's just unbelievable. Uh, a big project they're talking about from the infrastructure world is the Tappan Zee Bridge. These are things that we need to do to support infrastructure so we support business. Um, the money that we put into problems like uh, people being overweight 
it's, uh, this is money we could put into more, uh, in, in, not more important, but uh, something that can drive our economy and our businesses forward. Uh, another thing we have to think about is we have an aging population. Right now we have four uh, people who, uh, four working age people for every one retiree. By 2025 it's going to be 2.79. In some of our uh, communities farther north, I know that figure is even more, almost one to one. What we have to do is we have to create environments where businesses want to be, young people want to be, and that's going to be in regionally specific areas. Just to leave you another thing, when we talk about healthy businesses, it's going to, uh, we have to talk about what businesses do we get our biggest bang for our buck. Uh, you know, the, the big boxes of the world, they don't pay their fair share in tax revenue, and usually we have to create a lot more infrastructure if we're putting it out into an existing cornfield or somewhere else. So it's something to think about when you're looking to be, rebuild your community for healthy businesses. What pay the most tax revenue per, um, per acre? Uh, just to leave you with this, there has been a lot of progress throughout New York State. Uh, Buffalo is renowned for their, uh, their grassroots efforts. Uh, Push Buffalo, uh, Buffalo First, and they're all doing great stuff. Uh, in the Bronx, you'll see in the top right-hand corner, they're building great affordable housing. Uh, the left-hand corner is a project they're talking about in Rensselaer, right across the river here in Albany. Uh, you've seen conversions. You're seeing mixed-use grocery stores. It's in Saratoga, but I think that's a model that could work in other upstate areas. And these are all healthy ways we can combine a, a work-live-play environment in our existing urban, su suburban, and town centers. And this is Long Island. Even Long Island is doing smart growth. <laughs> Any Long Islanders? <laughs> I love the upstate crowd. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. So how we're going to do this today is just let the, each speaker go through um, about 10, 15 minutes each, and then we'll have the discussion at the end. So next we have Erin Heaney from the Clean Air Coalition of Western New York. Okay. And I'm going to stay here, folks. Are that okay sounds good. That? Okay. Um, so thanks, Anita, for having me. Um, the Clean Air Coalition is a grassroots environmental health and justice organization. Um, we uh, started in Tonawanda. Our offices are now, which is the first suburb north of Buffalo. Um, we're now located in Buffalo, and we work in a couple of different communities. Um, we, our mission is to build power and win campaigns that improve, uh, to advance policy that improves. Uh, the, the health of our members. Um, and so, you know, we kind of operate in a, in a very similar vein to what David said. Our, our kind of operating principle is you are where you live. We all know the expression, you are what you eat, but it is probably even more the fact that you are where you live. The air you breathe, the water you drink, the soil you come into contact every day with really impacts um, public health outcomes. Um, and so we work in a couple different neighborhoods. We work in Tonawanda, which Anahita mentioned earlier. Um, Tonawanda is one of the highest concentrations of air permitted facilities in New York State. I'm going to talk a lot about Tonawanda in a second. We work on the lower west side of Buffalo, um, that is the, has the third largest land port. So we get about 5,000 diesel trucks coming through that neighborhood every day. Um, and we've also started working in a neighborhood in between that and the city of Buffalo that has had a couple of industrial chemical fires, uh, the Black Rock neighborhood in Buffalo. So there's, there's four things that we think that we really need um, in order to have healthy communities and healthy people. Um, we need policies, good policy from the government that protects people and promotes equity. We need corporations and businesses that are responsive to community needs. We need strong grassroots leaders, and we need an evidence base to help fuel all that change. Um, and so I'm here today to talk a little bit about that, that second piece, corporations that are, and companies that are responsive to community needs and how we can begin to broker relationships between communities and businesses to hopefully have better businesses that are more profitable, that are more sustainable, um, and that promote better public health outcomes. So Anahita asked us to answer a couple questions, so I'm going to stick to that format. Um, you know, the, the first question Anahita asked is just why is it important that we are brokering relationships between businesses and communities, and why, why is it important that we're having this conversation? And for us, um, there's a lot at stake. It's literally our, our members' lives. Um, like I said, we're a grassroots organization, and so we have a member base in Tonawanda of people who um, are very sick. Um, in Tonawanda, as I said, there's 53 facilities in a, in a two-mile radius. So we have a, um, a coal-burning power plant. We have um, uh, the world's largest sponge-making facility. We have a, a foundry coke facility. We have several petroleum distribution terminals. We have several uh, chemical storage facilities. We, and those are the big guys, and then there's lots of other smaller facilities, manufacturing facilities. Um, and 
you know, the DEC has done a really wonderful job documenting some of the air pollution challenges that we have in Tonawanda. Um, our benzene levels are the highest in, in New York State where there are monitoring stations. Um, they're beginning to drop, which is really exciting, I think, because of the work that a lot of people in this room have done. Um, but we have very high benzene levels, formaldehyde levels, and several other hazardous air pollutants exceed what New York State Department of Health says is an acceptable exposure limit. Um, and so all of these processes that are happening in these businesses are con helping to contribute to some of the poor health outcomes that we see in Tonawanda. Um, New York State Department of Health did a health study um, about 10 years ago, um, not actually related to air pollution, but it looked at the same neighborhoods that we're looking at now and found that there were several, um, that we have elevated levels of several kinds of cancer in Tonawanda. Tonawanda has uh, elevated uh, levels of asthma and a lot of folks that work in the schools, you know, also are beginning to see a connection between that rising autism rates in, in that school district and um, and the heavy amounts of industry. So, um, you know, our members are at the receiving end of a lot of these processes. And so, you know, we need uh, healthy businesses because they're gonna help contribute to better public health outcomes and better outcomes for our members. Those are kind of the broad sweeping strokes. Folks that live, we have a small pocket of people that live like right in the middle of, it, of this, uh, of industry. You often hear the word fence line community. Those are communities that are right up against a lot of large facilities. Um, we have it like a donut hole. So we have about 300 of our members live right, right smack dab in the middle. And it's not uncommon. Um, most people that live on that street have lived there for a very long time. Many of them had two, three cancers over the course of their life. And they're still kicking, many of them. Um, and so, you know, when we're, t when we're talking about why we need healthy communities, we want to stop that from happening. Why we need healthy businesses, we want to stop that from happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's worked well. We're a relatively young organization, um, and so uh, we don't have a lot of lessons to share yet, but I can share some things that I know haven't worked, and then I want to share some ideas about how we can you know, build better relationships in the future. Um, we ran a campaign against a company uh, about two years ago, Tonawanda Coke Corporation, um, and it, it turned into kind of an aggressive uh, campaign. Um, we had we were asking uh, regulatory agencies to get involved to do enforcement action at the facility. But what so that, that has gotten a lot of attention. But what didn't get attention was that we did try to have a collaborative relationship with that company in the beginning. We went, the community went and asked to sit down with the company and the company just straight up refused. And so I think that that doesn't work if, if that's the first thing that doesn't work. You know, you need to have people on both sides willing to come to the table to negotiate in good faith. Since then, um, there have been several companies that have come to Tonawanda wanting to relocate to Tonawanda or wanting to open their business in Tonawanda, and we've begun to broker conversations between the community and those business owners or the potential business owners. <laughs> um, and so I think there's a couple things that, that work that are really important to, to beginning to build a collaborative uh, relationship. It's really important that communities are armed with really good data and that they have the skills to be able to negotiate. I think in communities where you see very confrontational relationships, um, there's not good infrastructure, there's often not a community-based organization there helping distill some of this extremely complex data and, and breaking it down so folks can under, actually really understand what's happening in their neighborhood. Um, it's important that you have that data too. Without the DEC's air monitoring, um, there would be no data by which we could make any kind of decision. So that's the first thing you need. You need good data. You need a mediating institution like a nonprofit or a really good um, public health department that's helping communities understand um, what's happening in their neighborhood. And they, they also need the skills to negotiate. A lot of folks um, where you see heavy industry, you tend to see low income populations um, that, that probably, you know, the, the, um, a lot of folks haven't gone to college, haven't completed high school even. And, and negotiating is a tough thing. And so actually giving people the skills to be able to go in and have the confidence to talk with companies about what they need in their neighborhood is, is really, really important. Um, so that's something that's really, really good. We found that um, we've had good, um, we've had success uh, communicating with companies when there's an internal champion at the company. Um, if there's not somebody on the staff that is really um, committed to this, um, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and we need the companies to come and negotiate in good faith. There have been, there's some communities that um, have gone to companies and the companies have sat down with them and, they, and it it's becomes very clear whether or not the company is there to negotiate in good faith or not. Are they actually willing to give something to the community that they're saying that they need? So um, those are a couple of things that, um, couple, I think, key elements that you need if you're going to have uh, a good relationship between communities and between businesses. 
you know, in the future, I think that we need um, it, more incentives for companies to do the right thing, um, not just out of the goodness of their heart, but we need policies um, and financial incentives for companies to do the right thing and to be able to, to give communities what they need. So, that, so some ideas might be, you know, uh, providing more funding for the, the Pollution Prevention Institute to do more audits in these communities. You know, Anahita's got the vision of what it could look like to have a, a, a you know, an industrial facility uh, corridor that really is minimizing waste. Um, providing financing to actually implement those solutions, um, and you know, maybe attaching financing to do um, to help companies do things like become B certified um, or get certified by a third party that's going to be able to, to um, certify whether or not they're actually doing things that are green. Um, so, you know, I think that we need to continue to invest in, in nonprofits that can be doing that education with communities. We need, um, the government, just, I mean, one of the questions is like, what can NGOs and businesses do? And I think the government has a really, really important role to play in providing, in providing those incentives. So um, I think that if we invest in educating communities, if we invest in providing financial incentives for businesses to do the right thing, I think we're going to see communities that are a lot healthier, communities that have built trust between companies, uh, with companies, and hopefully we will have better public health outcomes and probably more profitable businesses. So. Um, we're still working on it. So we could either, would you like to talk off the cuff or would you like to wait for the request? Not to put you on the spot here. It's your show. <laughs> you tell me. Well, if you want to start a little bit and we'll see if we can get your slides going and then we can have some discussion around your initial. Okay. Thank you. I'm Bob Bechtold. I'm from Harbeck. It's uh, located in Ontario, New York. We are a custom injection molder manufacturing company and in that we use a lot of energy, a lot of resources. Our resources are primarily petroleum based because they're uh, polymers. But what we've done, uh, at least over the last 10 years, and the slides were different examples of, the, of what we've done, is to try to uh, make our decisions and operating our company based on eco-economics. So not just the bottom line, but uh, to borrow from others the triple bottom line or uh, these uh, euphemisms or, or sayings that are going around now. <clears throat> what the slides hope to show is that I admire what my predecessors have been talking about and as the, in, the interest in finding incentives for business was one that really uh, rang out for me because what I was going to do is show the incentives. The incentives are there. They are, at least in our focus of these slides, was to be on energy, how we have an energy management strategy. Primarily, we do similar things in water and similar things in waste. Um, but, okay. So, um, the economics of all these things that I w uh, will or would show you are very intriguing, very inviting, very rewarding, and actually they help your bottom line. So my mission, typically when I ask to go out and talk about this, is to demonstrate that, and so I'll do that right now. <coughs> okay, thanks. And, uh, can you hear me still? The, uh, don't step down there, did you say? Do so. Okay. So, uh, I think I just said pretty much what's on there. The the um, green uh, is affordable, uh, economic responsibility, carbon responsibilities, and I can pretty much see this. Uh, so, corporate social responsibility is the, the corporation is what it's about. It's uh, our responsibility as a corporation. Um, the problem uh, is that uh, it's not easy. Uh, so in ways that you could really help businesses is to try to get banks to wake up because they're not there to do, and most of the reason why is because we're talking about longer uh, payback periods and everybody has this one mindset about what you should be willing to consider a reasonable ROI. 
And I propose that there's another set of considerations that has to do about using your energy dollars. And as long as you can pay for it with your energy dollars, it shouldn't really matter about this three-year limitation is typical. Some of the things we've done, uh, that, uh, briefly just to touch on, a combined heat and power plant, our uh, initial wind turbine, uh, nine years ago this month. Uh, lighting upgrades, combined heat and power project paid off uh, uh, eight years, or seven years actually after it was put in. Our uh, wind turbine paid off uh, a little, over, little less than eight years. Um, we're in the process right now of putting up our second wind turbine. And by this spring, we will have two wind turbines on the site. The new one will be uh, twice the size of the original one. The reason we're doing that is because the original one already paid for itself. And now we have about 12 to 20 years of additional 300,000 kilowatt hours a year coming to our company at no cost. Uh, basically at no cost. We have maintenance, but that's all. This is our combined heat and power plant. Uh, we are actually in the process right now of upgrading this. It's over 10 years old. It has performed incredibly well, and, but it's running right now at about 80% potential because some of them are getting tired after 10 years of continuous operation or more. And so we uh, just were awarded a grant from NYSERDA who did not have any involvement in the first time, but now they, it's just proven that it works. And so we're very happy that they are helping us to upgrade and refresh this uh, in this next coming year. But the important thing is that, um, uh, again, the seven-year ROI is a tough sell at the bank. So not only does it provide electricity for us, if you're not familiar with combined heat power, but it also provides heat and air conditioning. This is a schematic version, real-time presentation that's on our website that you can look at any time. Not only can you tell what it's doing at the moment, but you can explore any one of the elements by clicking on it, and it will give you all the historic data. Our wind turbine that I mentioned, why does this work economically? Um, everybody talks about the horrors of wind not paying and all of that. We're not even on that great of a wind site. You would never put a wind turbine on, we're on our, our wind farm on our site because it's not uh, bold enough or pr productive enough to pay off the investors. But it's a completely different economic model because the wind farms produce wholesale. So they're six and a half to seven and a half cents what they can hope to sell their power for. We're displacing retail. So every kilowatt that this makes is worth is displacing 15 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So it gives us a very uh, nice revenue stream of uh, over $45,000 a year, paid itself off. And that 20 to 25 years engineering life to rebuild that means that rebuild time, someplace the worst case scenario, 20 to 25 years after it's put up, you can refresh it for, at the most, half of the original project cost and start over for another 25 or 30 years. Our fleet is small, but we have five vehicles. They're all considered green vehicles. They're either all electric, hybrid electric uh, diesel or hybrid, hybrid electric gasoline. Our newest one was now uh, one year old, uh, or one month old. We just got a Volt, and it's actually in Detroit now at uh, visiting customers. The uh, idea of sustainable buildings is to conserve. So we, while we're not LEED certified, we learned a lot from <coughs> LEED. But 10 years ago, they didn't even understand about industrial and that. So uh, we learned the principles, the ideas, and applied them wherever we could. Didn't get certified. Our lighting upgrade, I mentioned uh, here, uh, the total cost of this project was $65,000. Even I had some resistance to that when they first brought it to me, but when I saw it play out, it was amazing because uh, it reduced our electrical costs, our annual electrical costs, by $38,000 a year. And a $65,000 project with a $16,000 grant and $8,000 in tax credit, so it paid for itself in less than a year and a half. And now, three or four years later, we continue to see that 38,000 or more to the bottom line. We take this way of thinking through every decision that we make in the company. And because there's lots of equipment and lots of energy using, everything has to meet the metrics of not only what does it cost and how can we pay for it, but how much energy does it use compared to every other alternative that we can find. And then when we, take, when we find the most energy efficient, 
We compare that to the almost always additional price that it costs. And as long as we can, within a, a reasonable amount of time, justify that additional cost, we will happily pay more for something that, in the long run, will save us more than the differential. And of course, all of that savings, and I'm ba barely here, basically here introducing the economic or the environmental part of this. Every time we save this energy or reuse something, we're saving money. And every time we do that, it goes to the bottom line. And money saved in this way is actual dollars. It's, it's final dollars. It's what you work all year long for to accumulate and to have some degree of profit. So these are dollars that go right to that final point because they're the real dollars of your company. If you're not paying them to a utility, you're paying them to your employees or, or uh, investing in the future of your business. Again, more examples, uh, all electric, all of our molding machines are electric. We have no hydraulic machines. Why? Because an electric machine is 50% more, can be 50% more economical uh, energy-wise and do the same exact job or better. So does it cost 50, 25 to 50% more initially? Yes, but you get that typically back and again in two or three years. Um, continuing on with other examples, uh, even air, uh, air compressors, things like that. But the eco-economic conclusion of all of this is that we control operating costs, we improve our competitive pricing because we're helping ourselves out economically, we ensure power reliability. When we have blackouts, we really feel bad about it for all of the other people in the community, but we don't have a blackout. We can go stand alone and run our company on our own turbines and our own potentials until the blackout is over, and then at our convenience, we go back on the grid. Uh, we also provide um, predictable energy costs decades into the future. I know exactly what 300,000 kilowatt hours a year that our company uses for 20 years because it's the wind. The wind turbine gives me 300,000 kilowatt hours a year. So I can either take it all up front, which is our preference. We like to pay for it at the beginning. So therefore, I talked about seven to eight years payback. Or you can take it over the life of the project and then reduce your energy costs by half or a third of what they would be during that period. But it's predictable. Wind is predictable, solar is predictable, plus, plus or minus 10% per year, no matter where you are and what it is. Uh, this is just a quick example, but I'm probably at my near the end of my time. How much time do I have left? A couple minutes, okay. So this is, again, some more of the eco-economics of that, and it's an interesting way of, of looking at it that I was given the advantage of as I experienced it. We are Green Power Partners with uh, Department of Energy, and, or EPA, rather, and in that, we have to report our energy consumed, energy that's green, and energy that's green that we made or purchased, because all of the per our power comes from three possibilities, our wind turbine, the micro turbines, which run on natural gas, and then our power that we buy from the grid, which we buy 100% green power. So in that, reporting that every year, from 2005 to 2008, I learned as I was reporting it and was uh, puzzled by what I thought was wrong numbers. I thought my controller hadn't given me all of the data. And when I finally figured it out, I had one of those aha moments because I got a chance to see what I'm talking about from a different perspective. And over a three-year period of time, we grew the business consistently every one of those years, grew its profitability, and at the same time reduced our total electrical consumption by 35%. And to make the point about how this affects the business in a positive way, at 15 and a half cents a kilowatt hour, that's $190,000 that I'm bringing directly to the bottom line. So to go out and try to get enough business to generate the margins that we do to have profit um, to end up with $190,000 is a couple of million dollars in new additional business. And I often, when I speak to professionals in my field, I say, if I could give you a way to add 10 or 20% to your sales, you'd jump all over that. But I'm giving you a way right here to re come up with exactly the same result by just rethinking how you pay your utilities and implement things like decisions like that. Um, other things, uh, pretty much most of that has been talked about. 
What's next for us? We are now putting up our second wind turbine. Hopefully this May or June it will be done. We're, I'm literally right in the middle of the final negotiations on that. This time we're putting up an 850 kilowatt machine on the other side of our building. It will be, uh, because wind is exponential, it's twice as tall, twice as big in diameter, but eight times as much power. Um, again, expect the same payback or better. Uh, we know no worse because our, we have no uh, fuel costs. We're not attached to any fuel, so we, have, we know what our payback will be. We're also striving to be carbon neutral, and a big part of our last 40% of our carbon footprint now, we're 60% carbon neutral currently. Our last 40% is in our combined heat and power plant. So the bottom slide talks about a wonderful technology that is being developed right now and hopefully will be in time. They are using one of our turbines, but uh, will give us a chance to burn uh, renewable fuels to, uh, in, our, in our current turbines and therefore uh, accomplish our, our carbon footprint. It's important for us to do it ourselves because it's of the economic advantage of it. Well, we believe that it will be a marketing advantage for us in the future and that other companies competing with us will, when the, when the awakening comes and they're required to have ISO 50001 or some kind of a certification like was mentioned before, when that happens, what are they going to do? They're going to go buy the answer. They're going to buy RECs or green credits or something like that so that they can get certified. And as soon as they do that, they open up our competitive edge even more. So we're out trying to tell everybody about it, saying we're basically going to eat your lunch if you don't pay attention. <laughs> Energy Rotors was another excellent. This is a company in Schenectady. This is a device that they brought into our company because we have a combined heat power plant. It was a great place to test it out. It ran perfectly. Uh, it basically takes the hot water and only the energy in the hot water and gave us back five kilowatts of power. It was so successful that we or this was a proof of concept machine. We ordered the first production unit, which we hopefully will be coming out this coming year, and it will be a 50 kilowatt unit. So in our combined heat and power plant, we hope to introduce the hottest, most premium hot water to this device first. When it's all done taking its couple of degrees only out of the water to give us the 50 more kilowatts, then we'll continue to do the same job as the water has already been doing. So our BTU efficiency in the plant will raise from 60 or 70 percent, depending on what time of year, to hopefully 80 and more percent uh, as we go forward. And that's it. It is really the final, here the uh, final statement though, it is a conviction, the eco-economic sustainable manufacturing that we have. We are striving to be carbon neutral and at Harbeck we regard eco-economic sustainability as absolutely critical to the future of our business. We believe that our success in the pursuit of it will improve our competitive advantages by ensuring our efficiency. That's all I have. Okay, questions for our panelists? <coughs> yeah. Hi, um, Bob. Hi, Sorry, Mary. Let me grab the mic. I think it's fabulous. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I really love it when business owners get it. They understand that this really makes a difference, a positive difference to the bottom line. And, you know, I guess my question to you is, you know, when, what, what, at, what was the first reason why you saw the light? that you understood this, and how do we get more business owners to do that? Well, I, the first, my uh, passion about it or interest, I guess goes back to childhood, because I've always been amazed by renewable energy. I, I've never lost the fascination for wind and solar and the different potentials, and from kite flying to wood burning with magnifying glasses, and all of those things, and just, so at my home, for example, I had my first wind turbine in 1980. But eventually, I, that passion moved into having a, already having a business, and how could I make it apply there? And the first real huge message to me was when I was trying to air condition an injection molding plant. And that's an enormous task. If, to put it into perspective, we have 9,000 square foot room with 25 injection molding machines. A good analogy would be a gymnasium with 25 industrial pizza ovens. If you turn them all on high, 
let them run 24 hours a day, and now your job is to air condition that room. So first reality that I had to deal with is this is going to be an enormous amount of energy that's required. And of course, being a small, or, you know, small business, that's all dollars because you have to buy those from the utility. But in pursuing that and learning and seeing how I already wanted to put up a wind turbine, and then I, the wind turbine couldn't do everything because the wind doesn't blow all the time, so I had to supplement it with something. And then in the process of finding out about that, I learned about combined heat and power. And so now we do that task, 25 pizza ovens in a gymnasium, day in and day out with no new energy. We're not using any new energy or additional energy to air condition that room because we're using a uh, combined heat power plant. We take the hot water to an absorption chiller. It give, we give it 200 to 210 degree water. It gives us back 44 to 47 degree cold water, and that's how we accomplish our air conditioning. So we're literally using what the utilities, what the world, the normal model calls waste heat. It's not waste. It's only waste because they're stupid and they're throwing it away. It is potential, it's, and we call it thermal opportunity. We always try to catch ourselves if we ever say waste heat because it's only, it's just waiting for you to think of something to do with it. On top of that, we make that job four times more difficult because we have every one of our molding machines is vented to the outside through an eight inch uh, flexible pipe. So that means that when you walk in our molding plant, usually you expect to smell the very, very pungent plastic that when people go home, their wives make them put their clothes in the garage because they don't stink up the house kind of stuff. It doesn't smell that way in our company. And so that opportunity to have all that fresh air makes our air conditioning job four times harder. And still we use no uh, new energy, just this thermal opportunity for making the electricity that we need anyway to run the injection molding machines. Yeah. Other questions? Barbara? I wanted to ask Bob if you, it's very interesting, if you've quantified, um, the, you said you grew the business, have you quantified how much the business grew uh, in any way and, and whether it made a difference for jobs well, in the plant, more jobs? Well, yeah, our business, I don't know the exact amount per year, I mean, I have it all, but I don't, I don't really focus a lot on that. We're now 35 years old and we've survived that long and so we're continuing to grow. This year was more profitable than last year. You know, we hit the recession just like everyone did and dropped 25%, 30%, something like that. And now we're back beyond where we were during the recession. So um, I think our we have two kinds of edges, a competitive one, but also innovative one. That's a whole nother talk but we have a lot of technology and opportunities to add uh, a good story to the manufacturing community. And a lot of them have no idea about what I'm telling this group. They, don't, they just assume we take our energy. And they get an idea when they drive in the parking lot and they see this enormous wind turbine, but they kind of think that's maybe my hobby or something like that. And most of the time, they don't even ask about it. Hi, I have a question for you too, Bob. Um, I'm, I'm Beth Mayer, I work for DEC. Um, have you quantified the, any the emissions reductions from your the energy reduction? Because you have both the energy conservation and then you have the wind turbine and your combined heat. So you're really reducing, I think, a lot of emissions. And what we found in Tonawanda anyway is that even though there are um, facilities that are emitting because of their industrial processes, a lot of the emissions are coming from Energy, they're coming from energy, which is a really interesting combination with NYSERDA. I mean, it, it's energy combustion. <coughs> the five chemicals that are of high concern are from combustion. Right. So I would love to know if you've yes. quantified that, because that could help us to make the case mm -hmm. in time. It is 60%. Uh, the, if you are aware of ISO 50001, yeah. the, com the industry represents 60% of the pollution problem. That's why their ISO 50001 exists now, is to go after that. So 50001 is the new standard where you, it's a wonderful thing that actually is a, a kind of a landmark because it's the first time ever that ISO has done anything. Remember ISO is 67 countries around the world that have to get together and agree on something. And they did ISO 50001 in less than one year. 
So if you think they've never, that's never ever ever happened in any of the ISIS, nine thousand, fourteen thousand. When did it? When did it come out? When did June? Oh wow! And it is huge because it. First of all, you get a rating. So we're in the process of this right now. We were lucky to be chosen by Department of Energy to be a superior energy performance in the Northeast. So we are starting that in January. Our first meeting is in Atlanta. And so we're in the pursuit of that certification. But it, when we get qualified, let's say we get, it's like LEED in a way because you get a color rating. So if we get a bronze rating, let's say for the first time at the end of our certification, you have two years. During that two years, you can maintain that rating. And if, if you, as long as at the end of the two years, you've improved. If you haven't improved, you lose the rating or you drop the rating. So it's a, an amazing reality about continuous improvement for energy management strategies, which is bottom line, uh, greenhouse gas. And so I apologize that I tried, pushed on the economics of this, but I assumed this crowd already knew about the environmental pretty well, so I just wanted to, to beat the drum about that it makes a lot of sense economically to be environmentally correct. Hi, a uh, question for Aaron. Um, I was kind of alarmed to hear about this air pollution in Tonawanda and, and just, I guess I just, from the eastern part of the state um, was, was kind of surprised, but is this due to individual companies being out of compliance or is it a combination of all these companies together that are creating this issue? Yeah, um, I think the challenge in Tonawanda, there are a couple bad actors in Tonawanda, but I think the real problem comes from such a high concentration in such a small area. Um, and, and, you know, having people right there and the way the wind blows, um, the predominant wind direction, there's a, a, a neighborhood right there as well. So um, it's really hard to, to pinpoint any specific company as causing, you know, especially legally to, to show that, you know, X caused Y. Um, but it's the, it's the con high concentration and the compounding. <coughs> the fact that you've got so many facilities producing all different kinds of things. Yeah, so I think it's okay. really the Thank key you. I have One other quick question for Bob. Yeah. Um, I really like the fact that you're, you analyze your R ROI based on the retail <coughs> cost of, of the power versus the commercial sector, which is analyzing it versus the wholesale. Um, would you see, you know, if other companies out there with high energy use would you see a lot more of these projects being coming uh, viable and, and we see a lot more of your, your kind of uh, efforts out there? Well, I, uh, that's, w that's why I do this, come to talk to people about it, is to get that message out because unfortunately uh, people most, probably the most asked question again is why don't more people do it? And I don't know the answer to that. I know why I did it. And it makes good economic sense, and I happen to care about the environment, I have grandchildren, and all those other reasons. But I think the reason why I don't more people do it is because energy is too cheap. It's way too cheap. You know, we're not paying the real price for energy. Mm -hmm. So the hope, what I see will change that, is carbon reality. And when we have carbon reality, this 50,001 that I'm talking about is like the great white hope for that because that is, in whatever way you look at it, it comes down to carbon reality. You know, and we, we live in a world that throws away 75% to, to deliver 25% to your house or to my business. I don't get that doesn't quite work, you know, and when we have insurmountable problems, well, why don't we start there? And so I don't, I just, try to show that it makes great economic sense. The environmental part is even huger. And I'd love to, I have done the analysis and I've got, I've turned it, if you'd like to look at our website, we've got one where we turn, how many forests does it take to make a harbeck or something like that? We turn it all into acres of, of forest. So we do, we think a lot about that and how much greenhouse gas is not being committed as a result of what we do. Other questions? Comments? I have a question for Bob and Aaron. <laughs> oh, where? Oh, Tim. Your question. I'll go last. Hi, Tim Kirchgraber from DEC. I had a question for David. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the, uh, was it the Land Bank Use Act? The Land Bank Act? The le yep, the Land Banks Act. And if you had any, um, since you're only a couple blocks away, if there's any examples of how that might have been applied in the Albany County area. Okay. Uh, actually, 
in November we held a meeting where we brought in uh, one of the most successful people from Flint, Michigan to talk about how they implemented the land bank uh, in, in Michigan. But the Land Bank Act, so the, the idea of it is to start a nonprofit organization that uh, has uh, the power to take control of property. They can then either keep it, rent it, they can renovate it, they can um, send it to someone who they know is going to do something with the property that fits the community's vision. And uh, the, the whole idea is to take local control and ownership over properties that mean something to, to an area. So for example, if for a residential property, if you have one property which has just been that bad apple, and you have two or three good properties around it, and you know if another property starts to go, that whole block could deteriorate, the whole idea is the land bank can take that property, refurbish it, either keep it and rent it, or they can um, uh, sell it to uh, uh, a homeowner that you, you trust is going to do the right thing. You can also start, uh, you Does know. Does the nonprofit make that decision? Well, the nonprofit is controlled by a board, which is controlled by people within the community, uh, community leaders, but also government officials. But yes, the nonprofit has the, the ability to make those decisions. Um, in Albany and a lot of cities, Buffalo, Syracuse, we have a lot of buildings that are beyond that stage where you can really recoup them. They can also take them down and sell them as a side lot to a neighbor. They can split them and sell them as side lots to both neighbors. The whole idea is to create a more livable environment so that we can get businesses, uh, you know, as Bob has been talking about, it, it makes a lot of sense to do a lot of these energy uh, efficiency issues because it, it makes economic sense. It also makes economic sense to have a vibrant urban center and vibrant main streets. And the more people that we have surrounding mass transit and using that, the more economic sense it makes for our governments and for those individuals. So yeah, land banks, um, you're in Albany? Yes. Contact your Albany County representative and tell them that you're excited about this idea. I know Chris Higgins was at our event. He's very excited about it. Something that could really help uh, the Albany region, Buffalo and all the upstate regions. Thank you. So question for Aaron. Yep. When should communities and businesses really start to build these relationships? And what are the means to do so? So for instance, in Tonawanda, um, you know, when there's, there's a crisis, there's often a conflict maybe between the NGOs and the industry, right? So what are your thoughts about when there's not a conflict and there is, for now, a healthy environment? Um, what are the means for those communications to start happening in a non-threatening manner? Yeah, so uh, Buffalo Color, which is a, a company in Buffalo, it's not in Tonawanda, it's in the city, they have a very successful relationship with the community that borders their facility. And it's an ongoing relationship. So it was born out of a crisis, there was an accidental release, people were really concerned. Um, but the, they had an internal champion at the company that came and negotiated in good faith with the community and so the key, the company up front kind of invested in some things that the community was asking for so like an emergency response you know some way to communicate when there are emergencies um, the company actually let the community do testing outside the facility because they trusted them and then it was an ongoing relationship so there were like quarterly meetings that they <coughs> sorry I'm losing my voice um, that the company had with community leaders on a regular basis. So yeah, I think it's really important that it's not a like, ha ha, gotcha. Um, though sometimes that's important. Sometimes, you know, when there are accidents, companies need to be called out. But if we have an, if they have an ongoing relationship, it doesn't have to be this tenuous, you know, hopefully that, I'm sorry, and you can't have water in here. <coughs> hopefully the relationship's there, so when, I can't talk. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so hopefully the relationship's there. Um, so you have a cough drop. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I mean, the community, the two companies that have come to us, there's a biodiesel company and a recycling company that have come to us before they moved in and, and said, I wanna, we want to talk to the community. We want to build this relationship from, from the very beginning so that we don't have issues down the road and so that we're addressing things that you know, the people who literally live down the street from us are worried about. So, yeah, I think it's got to be an ongoing relationship. That takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, but I think that's how you're going to address the issues before they become too bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the cough drops. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and a quick question for Bob. Um, so, bottom line, how can we get other companies to follow your great model? And what's preventing them from doing so, in your opinion? 
Uh, I think you'll see a whole lot of responsiveness and and uh, action happening if you half or double the cost of energy. You know, and I don't think that's going to happen because everybody claims that that will ruin the economy. I don't really think it will. You know, if we really pay the real cost for energy, I don't know why we try to uh, convince ourselves that we can't pay the real price for things. And well, I believe when that happens, when we pay for carbon, we will, some companies will lose a little and some companies will win a little. So it will be kind of a dis, it will be a reproportioning, a reapportioning of things, but it won't close us down. And proof of it is countries that are more mature than us, who are already paying more than us, but have quite substantially less impact on the environment than we do. So there's great teachers out there in the world, and I, I don't know any other way that you're going to get people to change them to hit their pocketbook. I, I would just add, too, that we, at least in Western New York, uh, we, you, we've got to stop giving away government subsidies to companies that are refusing to even have the conversation about, uh, you know, what, without even doing a, uh, an audit. You know, I know in Western New York we, we give significant economic development dollars to companies who, and we, we don't say, hey, we'd like you to look at this. We don't even say, hey, will you look at it? We're not even mandating that they do it, which we probably should. You know, if you're going to get government money, you should be assessing your process. You should be looking at ways that you can reduce your, your impact on, on communities. So I think that that's a huge, we can't keep giving money to companies that are not doing what, what's, what you're doing. You, know? you need to write down 50000 in one. 50,000? <laughs> yeah. ISO 50,001 is that. You could yeah. make the people that are want to become eligible for these benefits or opportunities, make them get ISO 50,001 certification. Because that says they're going to be responsible. Right. right. Uh, or something like that. But that one is right in the front of the industrial world right now. Right. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Paul Shatsoff. I'm with the Workforce Development Institute. And about two years ago, I visited Harbeck Plastics and Bob gave us uh, the tour. If you're ever out that way and you want to see a laboratory for uh, not only a clean energy environment, an innovative energy, energy environment, all in one small area, it's pretty amazing what he's done. Um, from using waste energy from a horse farm behind his plant to uh, the wind turbines uh, and, and to all the to capturing the water on the roof and a pond and, and some of the other things he's done. It, it's, it's really fascinating and, and you know, a lot of us, uh, we're, we're trying to do a lot to promote manufacturing in New York State uh, at the Workforce Development Institute and change the image of manufacturing. If you ever want to see a, what a modern manufacturing plant looks like, uh, and, and I know Bob would be willing, I would think, that, to walk you through, uh, it's, it's just a, a fabulous place uh, to go through. It's clean, the employees are smiling, and then you see all this uh, innovative energy stuff all around you uh, and that Bob takes such pride in and he should but uh, so I want to commend you and I wish there were more people like you and and uh, that you know that we're doing the sorts of things that that you're doing at Harbeck so thank you just to follow up on that I used to work at Xerox Corporation and Bob is actually conveniently located next to Xerox so every day I would drive to work and you could see his big big windmill <laughs> My husband and I would always say, who's this innovative company? You know, who, I can't wait to know these guys. And now you have another one going up, so that'll be great. Uh, I'm Pat Golden from the New York State Assembly. Um, David, you mentioned, or you cited uh, some uh, recent surveys talk, uh, discussing people's feelings on living uh, more urban, less exurban. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know, I mean, the attention focused on that probably in terms of the, the demographics and the economy, how those, how those things affect those kinds of surveys, those answers. And I mean, how you overcome, as things swing back, the economy uh, improves, uh, demographics change, how, you know, if, if there's any thoughts on how we address keeping that momentum going in terms of people living, you know, uh, making quality of life more of an efficiency thing in, in terms of uh, in space, I guess. Uh, you know, yeah. People. I, th <clears throat> I think our two major points are that energy costs are driving uh, a lot of people's decisions. I don't think that's going to change. I think that uh, 
energy costs might not rise to the level that we might want to see, but they're definitely not going down to a dollar or a buck twenty per gallon of gasoline. Um, so I think with higher energy costs, people are going to have to start thinking about being closer. Another thing that's not going to change: we're getting older, especially upstate New York. Um, it's we're going to be having fewer young people paying for an older population. That older population, uh, I think 70% live in single family homes, usually in the exurbs. They're gonna have to, if they have enough saved for retirement, uh, use that money to be taken to doctor's offices and to uh, activities that they wanna do. Um, so the momentum, I think, will come. And my age group, a lot of us are just saying we're not that interested in that uh, exurban lifestyle. Uh, not to say that some will still be interested and that's fine, but we have to create that environment where uh, the majority of our population wants to live around places where you can work close to it or at least get there by transit or you can, um, or you can live close to something to do. So uh, I think the momentum's there and I think that energy and an aging population is it's going to stick around even if the economy improves. Okay, well, that concludes our session this morning. Please join me in thanking our panelists one more time. And I encourage you all to take just a short 10 minute break and then we'll get started again. Thanks. Take her home with me. I know. <laughs>